five years ago, I was at a party in Los Angeles when this uh, girl approached me and started engaging in what is known as small talk. Now, you've all seen that in the last 24 hours. It has three components that you probably uh, are aware of. One is the person asks you uh, what your name is. This part is not relevant because they forget it right away. You can practice that by trying to ask the person next to you what your name is and see how their gaze shifts slowly to your breast as they try to remember what you just told them minutes ago. There's a second component which is try to figure out uh, where you're from, especially if you have this foreign accent. And then there's the main part, which is trying to figure out what you do. They ask you what you do, and this, has, this is very loaded. It tells people something about your uh, status, your value, uh, where you spend a lot of your time. It's very indicative in our day and age of, of people's choices. So when she asked me what I do, I took a really deep breath because this was a new thing for me. I just restarted my entire life about a week before. And the, the way it went was that as a kid, people kept asking me and other kids, what do you want to do when you grow up? And kids have kind of classic answers, fireman, taxi driver, the owner of a candy store, Superman. And I always wanted to be a scientist. Now, I didn't really know what scientist means at the time. I just had a bunch of books that my dad had, and they had all the scientists in them. I watched Back to the Future, and there was this Emmett Brown character with fizzy hair. I loved Feynman as a character. So I kind of had an idea of what scientists mean. I didn't really know, and I definitely didn't have an idea would I want to be a physicist, an economist, a computer scientist. This was far, far from me. But, but I knew that this is something I want to do, but I didn't really know how you become that. There was, it was actually easier for me to figure out how you become Superman than how you become scientist. This has at least like a star that you start in. So I didn't know how to pursue that, and therefore I pursued what I did know, and this was computers. I became a kid who started playing with computers at first just by using them, and then I learned how they worked, and before long I started being really good and toying with them, to the point that I could actually change things. So at first I just added one more life to Mario, and then I learned how to uh, get the passphrase in King Squares and so on and so forth. And before long, I was a really good hacker. So it wasn't surprising that when I became 18 in Israel, I was recruited by the Israeli intelligence to be a hacker in the military. And I did a really good job there. But what was surprising was that somehow I found myself in jail at the army for doing the same thing. <laughs> what happened was that uh, as I joined the army, I created this little script that just ran in the background and kept collecting people's passwords. And they were just running freely on the network. And I just collected them. I had this big text file of my colleagues in the army. I just collected their passwords for a while, for three years, in fact. And, and this was known to everyone. <laughs> everyone knew that. And this was not a problem. In fact, people came to me and said, you know, uh, uh, Anthony forgot to lock, uh, left his computer locked. Can you open it for us? And I would just look at the password. And I said, no problem. I was kind of the underground IT of the army for a while. But then something happened. Internet became very kind of popular at the time, and everyone started having dial-up at home, and suddenly there was this word, cybersecurity and threats, and people started getting afraid of that, and they started looking for some kinds of evidence that it might happen to us, and suddenly they hear about this soldier that has a script that runs for three years now, and has tons of passwords, and this became a big thing that led to me being uh, put to trial at the army, and sentenced to uh, uh, seven days in military prison, which is nothing, but still, it's a way to make a, make a statement. So I was spending seven days in prison as a hacker for the first time in Israel, having to think about my life since I was going to finish the army in a few weeks, and I didn't really know what I'm gonna do next. But when I came out of this, this prison, this little detention center, they gave me my belongings back, and I got my uh, army uniform, and I got a lot of things, and I also got my mobile phone, this bulky thing that I had at the time, and I turned it on, and there were dozens, if not hundreds of messages from security companies offering me jobs <laughs> as hacker. <laughs> so I'm here to tell you that crime does pay. Um, so I, I realized that there's a market value to actually knowing how to break into computers. So I had this idea to assemble a team. It was me and three other people. Uh, we called ourselves the Beat Team. Uh, it was a play on the word Beat and Team. Uh, a team was taken at the time. <laughs> and, uh, and the idea that we were hired by banks as lawful hackers. We were, we were doing what we called uh, penetration testing. It sounds kinky, but uh, it was actually <laughs> uh, uh, we would go to, to a, we would get access to banks and try to see if there's a way for us to move money from one place to the other, to change accounts, to see information that is not accessible for others. And then we would go to the banks and explain to them in details how this can be done. We would write a long report that explains to people how you can do that and help them in a way secure themselves better from the real villains. 
So our team had me. There was a young apprentice, a 17-year-old kid who was about to go to the army, who just joined us. There was uh, this psychologist who was in her late 30s, and she was in charge of what we call UMINT, human intelligence. She was especially good in calling people at uh, 5.55 p.m. and saying, uh, hi, I'm the agent at the, 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 uh, outside, and I need the password for this thing. Uh, I have the letters A and Q, but it doesn't work. Can you help me? And people would say, no, we cannot help you. It's not OK. And then she would say, oh, never mind. But I and she would kind of make people give her things. If they didn't give her, she would then say, never mind, thank you. And then they would, they would be called by the chief security officer in the company, telling them, congratulations, you didn't give your password. We're so happy for you. You would send this attack. And then it would turn out that she was that person as well, and she would use that to get the passwords. <laughs> so she had many ways to get people to give her information. And we had a fourth guy who was, and still is, I think, in my mind, one of the best hackers out there. He is one of the guys now behind uh, WikiLeaks. He wrote Tor, and he uh, is one of the guys who are kind of in, uh, empowering the Bitcoin currency. He's uh, still doing that job uh, uh, for many years now. The four of us would, <coughs> would work for a lot of banks doing that for a while. And this was a great job, but the report. But other than that, it was a really good job that, that I enjoyed doing. And actually, people, when I was asked what I do, they didn't remember my name, but they definitely remember this job in those small talks. So I felt I'm stable. Until one day, something happened that kind of changed everything. Now, mind you, I still remembered liking to be a scientist. I still just didn't think about that much. So one day, I'm sitting in the office, and we were tasked in trying to break into a small bank in Tel Aviv, a tiny branch, and we did a great job in, in figuring out how to do it in one day. So after one day, we could get into the bank, change accounts, move money from one place to the other, see everything. This was done. And I was ready to write the report and sign off on everything when Tammy, the, 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 the psychologist in our team, comes to my office, and she has this very uh, aggressive and, and, and impatient look. Now, I and all of us in the team knew that she also broke up with her boyfriend that week of nine years because she wanted to have kids. He didn't want to have kids. They dragged it for a while, and they ended up to, decided to make it up that week. So I knew that she's in a very delicate state, and I should be more patient with her when I uh, talk to her. And she came to me and said, uh, um, I want to talk to you about this report or this bank that we just uh, finished uh, getting in. I think we should uh, uh, reopen it and do one more thing with them. I said, what do you mean? She said, look at the contract we have for them. There's something there that you should look at. And she points out the contract that I have. And the contract looks generic, like all the contracts. It has the job description, what we need to do, what we need to report. And she points out to one line. And I look at that line, and I knew immediately that there's trouble coming. This line said something, the team uh, will employ any means of breaking into the bank, trying to find the vulnerabilities, including uh, software, hardware, physical, and organizational. And as I read that, I knew exactly what she wanted. She wanted us to try to break into the bank physically. Now, up to that moment, we always did that, but remotely. We sat in our office, we logged in, we tried things. We never, ever had the idea or the knowledge of how to actually go into a bank and take money. But we were allowed to. We were, in theory, allowed to do that. They wanted us to, to study <laughs> the physical security. They wanted us to see if we can do things. And she was eager, at this very delicate state, to do just that. <laughs> and I said to her, I don't think it's a good idea. We don't know anything about bank robbery. It's not our field. It's not our profession. I don't think we should do that. This is, this is a bad idea. And she started arguing all kinds of things. Some made sense. Some did not. And as she said that, I looked to my right. And I was reading a book at the time by Feynman. Surely you're joking. A physicist that really influenced me in many ways. And he writes there something about saying yes. He says something about his idea as a scientist of taking on adventures and saying yes to things and how this actually encouraged him to do good science and also to be an interesting character. And as I looked at her, at this book, I also heard Tammy uh, using the best argument so far, which was, please, 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 let's rob the bank. <laughs> and I somehow looked at this book, I looked at her, and I said, OK, let's do it. Let's try to break into the bank. So. I don't know how many of you had, had the opportunity to break into a bank uh, <laughs> before. Uh, there, are, there isn't a lot of information out there for people who want to do that like, mm, commonly. There's no uh, breaking into banks for dummies, dummies book or something. Like, you, have to, you actually have to, have to use some information from uh, you know, uh, The Sopranos and uh, other TV series you've seen or, or films or information that you somehow gather yourself on how this is done. And we spent the entire weekend planning a bank robbery. Now, the plan we had was pretty simple. We were going to go to a small branch that had only one teller. Gal, the young intern, is going to go first into the bank. He's going to act as if he's a customer and kind of scan around the place and signal us from the inside when there's only one person there, only the teller. So no one's going to 
you know, no, it's going to be any customer there. So we were afraid that someone's going to, I don't know, pull a gun and start acting like, like a hero, which would look really bad in the report. Um, <laughs> so we, so we, we made sure that no one is there. And then Nathan, the, the fourth guy, he would stay outside in case something goes out of hands and he's going to come and just save the day. And Tammy and me, we're going to go inside and we're going to actually rob the bank. So we get the signal. It's Monday morning. We approach the bank and we start walking towards the teller. Now, as we walk towards there, there's like 10 seconds where you can slowly, time stand still, and you walk towards there, and you know that as long as you didn't say the words, this is a bank robbery, you can take everything back. <laughs> you can still go ahead and forget, and nothing's gonna happen. But once you said those words, even if you say, never mind, forget it, you're still, like a, you're still in a bank robbery. So there's, there's no way to, this is, like, once you said the words, it's like downhill no matter what. So I was hesitating for a while when we were working, that, but Tammy, she just woke up with her boyfriend, she doesn't take any, she went straight, and it went to this woman, this is a bank robbery, we wanna uh, go back and, and take one of the safe boxes. Now we made a lot of preparations before, we knew exactly which one we're gonna uh, take, we knew that there's one that has a little amount of cash, we're gonna just take that into account. And if I created the picture so far, that this was like a perfect movie like Bank Heist with the, the ex-con, the psychologist, the intern, the teller was the character out of character. She couldn't care less about this thing, she was Studying for the SATs, she put a bookmark, said just a second, went to the back room, really not the character you want in a bank robbery. <laughs> so she goes with Tammy to the back room, to the back room, and they're starting to empty one of the boxes. Gal, the skid, he had another assignment. His job was to actually use this time to take pictures of the bank and try to see if there's all kinds of things that are actually physical problems, like someone leaving a post-it note with a password next to a computer, something we can actually report, uh, cameras that are not uh, uh, working on batteries that you can actually uh, then take the batteries off, all kinds of things like that. So he's doing that. Tommy's in the back room emptying the uh, safe box, and I, with all the rehearsal, cannot remember for the life of me what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I'm sitting there waiting, you know, I could have bought a book or a crossword, I'm just waiting, and nothing happens, I, I, I have nothing to do, so I'm just looking around, waiting, 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 and then I see Gal, who's a kind of short guy, he was at the time trying to take a picture of one of those drawers that were left with a key in it, and he's pretty short, so he's trying to take a picture, and he can't reach it well, so I say, well, I should at least help him. So I go to this guy, hold my hands, and he climbs on my hands, and I hold him together when he takes pictures. Just when this happens, the teller comes back. Now, for her, this was a customer and a bank robber. So you can imagine her look when she sees the customer and the bank robber, together trying to take pictures of the bank. This was pretty surprising to her. So she realized right away that something is not right with what's going on there. Tommy comes back to me with a little box, the safe box that we were gonna empty, and I mistakenly apparently open it. And what I see inside is that there are, there's diamonds there, just the simplest way of saying that. We were expecting to have only a little money there that we can take, but there were diamonds and jewelry there. This was not expected. We didn't know that we were supposed to have only, you know, money is easy, you just transfer. Jewelry is real stuff. And we can't take that. And I tell her, Tommy, we have to give it back. This is not gonna, this is not, we, this is, this is, we're not insured for that. This is something that we cannot use. We have to put it back. This is, this, we can't take it. She says to me, what are you talking about? And I said, this is real. And we start arguing in what now looks more and more like a Monty Python heist than anything else, as we argue. All the while, Gal, who has now been exposed, he kind of looks at the teller, she looks at him, they're 17, or 25 and 17, and they you know, start talking, and he explains to her that he's part of the team, that the, he starts engaging with her, as kids do, while I grab the, the, the box and I go back to the teller in a very apologetic way and I say, uh, look, miss, I'm really sorry, we have to give it back, can I? And she looks at me and she says, here's the key, you put it. <laughs> I take the key, go by myself to the back room, start looking for the safe box and putting that, spend a few minutes doing that, come back to see the following. I see Gal giving his phone number to the teller. <laughs> now, we, we had a long discussion over the weekend whether we should not or should wear ski masks and gloves on us. I'm pretty sure, I didn't read any book, but I'm pretty sure that's a robbery 101, you don't give your phone number to the person you're stealing from. <laughs> I see that. At the same time, a customer, a real customer, actually entered the bank and she didn't even notice that something bad is happening because, you know, it looked like so mundane. So she was actually writing a check for herself and holding her baby in the hands. This is uncomfortable for her. So Tommy, who loves babies, offers to help her. So she goes to her, carries the baby, while this customer writes a check for herself and Tommy is singing a lullaby. So this is what I see when I come back. I see Tommy holding a baby, singing a lullaby, and Gal writing his phone number to the teller. I realize this is not gonna work out. I grab Gal in one hand, I grab Tommy on the other hand and we walk outside the bank in anger into the car and drive away. Now, as we drove away, I was kind of excited about it. Tommy was a bit nervous. She was not happy with all that's happened. Gal in the back seat is pretty happy because he's got a date with this woman tomorrow. <laughs> and we kind of think about our day in the office and, and I evaluate that and I tell myself, you know, just saying yes to things actually led to something pretty adventurous that is 
bigger than, than my job. And while we fail, this might be a, a good time to think about things that I don't say yes to normally and maybe consider that. There's, there's this thing that I was thinking about for a while that I wanted to do and I just kind of got into my job by getting into my job without thinking. Maybe it's time to consider what I want to do. There's a book that I read by Asimov that has a beautiful quote. It says, the bishop is the most important piece on the chessboard in the eyes of the bishop. And I felt like maybe I should think about the one thing that I wanted to do and since you know, failure is part of my job, I might as well fail in something that creates things rather than destroy things. And maybe I should fail in something that in the end, if it works, promotes a society much more than just a little bank, but to greater thing. And this is when I decided that I'm gonna change my career and restart everything in a really profession that I didn't know anything about. So when I was at the party five years ago, and this girl approached me and asked me what I did, I took a deep breath and for the first time, after many years of saying I'm a bank over, and expecting a nice smile, I said, I'm a neuroscientist. And what do you do? She says, I'm a banker. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>